All right. I think we're going to begin now. Um, welcome to the second session of the lecture series, Ethics and Globalization. It's really great that so many people are here. Um, I think even more than last time, but last time we, um, yes. Uh, I think I have to formally inform you that this lecture is going to be recorded, but um, you're not going to be in a picture, but just in terms of what you're going to say in the questionnaire um, session is going to be recorded and later be accessed on e-learning. Um, yes. Well, now it's time to welcome our distinguished guest for tonight, um, Dick Besema. He is a... <laughs> He's a professor of economics at, at Groningen University in the Netherlands. Um, he's worked and published in a number of fields, um, among them um, the uh, relation of credit and financial systems, of microeconomic out outcomes, um, on financial fertility, economic models in general, and the especially uh, on the financial crisis um, since 2007. Uh, and financial cycles in particular also. Um, but I'm, that's about it, what I'm gonna say. I think I'm gonna hand the floor to Dirk. And he's gonna make a presentation for about an hour, maybe less or more. And after that, we're gonna have a questionnaire session um, for you people to ask questions. Great, so here we go. Thanks a lot, Michael. Thanks a lot, Michael, and also thanks to the members of the students organization who put all this together. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, thank you for turning up so late in the evening, after a long day, no doubt, of hard study work, listening to another lecture. I try to keep it interesting and not too long. Um, so I will talk today about um, the financial sector and whether it works for us, us or doesn't and when it works for us and what the reasons are that it works well or does not work well and whether there's too much of it. Um, to start with that, um, there's been in academia a lot of research recently about the size of the financial sector. Until a few years ago, um, empirical empirical economists looking into this agreed there was a consensus that uh, more banks is better, more financial development is good for economic growth. And this is now turned around. There was, a, there was a paper a couple of years ago with the title, Too Much Finance? Question mark. Too Much Finance. And this was very widely reported, also in the Financial Times. There was a piece by Martin Wolf, which, is, which you see here, uh, Bloomberg, BBC, and so on. How is it possible that you can have too much finance. What do we mean by that? Do we mean too much money? I mean, is there anyone here who, who has too much money? Um, well, being students, probably not. Maybe your dad does, uh, maybe your mom does, but um, how can anyone have too much money? Even millionaires don't seem to have too much money. This is the money stock in the United States. You can see that since 1980, um, it has about increased sixfold, if I'm not mistaken, from about two trillion to 12 trillion dollars now, that's nominal. That's not scaled by the size of the economy. Of course, the economy is expanded as well, but still, a six-fold increase in money um, over 35 years, isn't that a bit much? Okay, maybe it's a bit much, but what is the problem? There's no inflation, so how is it possible that to increase money by six-fold without inflation? I don't know which economic theories you have in the back of your head now. Raise your hand if you study economics. Okay, that's about two-thirds of you maybe. So then probably you have a sort of notion that more money means inflation. Okay, well, we had very low inflation um, since the 1990s at least, but money stocks have increased enormously. This is Germany. I mean, this is not just the States. In Germany, since 1980, well, money has about increased from 500 billion euros, Deutsche Mark then, to 30,000. 
sorry, to 30,000 billion. Yeah, I should get the zeros right here. So also a six-fold increase. Hey, that's striking. Also a six-fold increase. And also no inflation problems. So what's going on? What do we mean when we say there's too much finance, there's too much money? Or well, what is money, actually? Let's, let's start really fundamentally. What is money? Any takers? What, what do you think is money? So, 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 sorry, raise your hand if you want to say something. Otherwise, mm -hmm. agree? Did we all hear it? Okay, sorry, can you say it again? You trust, vertrouwen. Money is trust. If we all agree on that, then I can continue. No, you shake your head. Why not? Okay, did we all hear that? Yeah, okay. Uh, is it the same as trust? No, yes? What do you think? It's a hard one. Keep thinking. Other answers to the question, what is money? In the back. Agreement? Okay, this is all very philosophical. Trust and agreement, I mean... I got money here, you know, that's no trust or agreement, but okay, okay, interesting. Um, well, actually, um, there was an Austrian, an Austrian economist, um, Josef Schumpeter, who said there's as many definitions of money as clouds in the sky. Okay. Um, so it's okay to say different things here because money is a multifaceted concept. Um, and clouds in the sky change their shape continuously, and so, sometimes they float away and new ones appear. Um, I'm going to emphasize one aspect of money. Until recently, well, until 20 years ago or so, which was recently in the history of economic thought, um, there is a sort of uh, canonical theory of how, what money is and how money was invented, right? So somewhere in prehistory, um, you have a cow, I have a donkey. We want to change and we, we need to something to pay each other the difference. And then some bright guy in prehistory had the, the, the smart idea to pick up a clump of gold or uh, pick up a shell or something. And that, they started using that to, um, to reduce the transactions cost of barter, as economists like to say. Okay? Now that's um, a story about how money emerged, which has been told for a very long time, at least since Aristotle. And it has become popular, especially in the 19th century, in German-speaking textbooks. Um, but there's very little evidence, very little evidence for it. It's, in that sense, it's a fable. It's a didactic story. It's a story to teach something about what we perceive as the use of money. It, it reduces transaction costs. And, and we've made up this story, that this is how money emerged historically, but there's no archaeological evidence for it or, or such. A lot of research over the last decades, uh, the last 20, 30 years, supports another view on what money is, for which there is archaeological evidence, and that is the view that money is a form of debt. Um, and so I'll first talk about what is money, and I, I promise you that it will be relevant to 2016, even though it's history, and then I'll talk about how money is used uh, when we might have too much of it, what it might mean and what we could do about it if we wanted to do anything about it. Now, in explaining why, why debt might be uh, what characterizes money, I rely on a little documentary that we, we made uh, with a number of other people in Groningen, Debt, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Um, imagine, and this, so this is another fable, I'm going to tell you another fable, a made-up story, but it's, it's grounded on archaeological evidence. Um, and historical evidence. Now, somewhere in prehistory, um, here's a farmer and a hunter, and um, the, f the hunter's just shot a deer, and he wants to exchange this with the farmer. So we are in an economy here. What is an economy? At its most primitive form, an economy means specialization of labor and exchange, and they are like the two blades of a scissor. You can't have specialization of labor with no exchange, because if I make tables and you make bread, and we don't exchange, you know, then I will starve and you'll never have a table. So they, they belong together. As soon as you have this, you have a sort of primitive economy, you might say, apart from a hunter-gatherer economy. So here we are in a primitive economy, 
um, it's winter and the farmer doesn't have grain, doesn't have grain to give to the hunter. What should they do? And this is also a very common problem because products get onto the market at different times of year, especially in a seasonally grounded economy like primitive economies, but also in our highly developed economies. Products get on the market at different times of the year, still you want to exchange them. So from the earliest times, from prehistory, from before we have written, written sources, people have invented means to bridge the gap. They've invented credit and debt. Credit is a means to bridge this gap when you have a transaction to make. Um, which means that the farmer agrees to take the meat, no fridges in prehistory, so you have to consume it now, even though it's winter in this picture, um, and the hunter agrees to do that without being paid now, but he will probably agree to get five kilos of grain in summer. At this point, a credit and debt transaction is taking place. The hunter agrees to become a debtor to the farmer who is a creditor. The hunter is in debt to the farmer, okay? Um, that's quite simple, but if you live even in a small society, like a small tribe, and you have credit and debt relations with every other member of the tribe, it gets very complicated. We know that from network theory, and even though people in prehistory didn't know network theory, they knew it was complicated. So again, in prehistory, people have started to uh, set up systems to record what's going on, to keep track of credits and debits, okay? So already in prehistory, people were doing accounting. Albert Einstein supposedly said that in prehistory, people made three big inventions, fire, the wheel, and double entry bookkeeping. Now that may be a bit uh, over the top, but there's something in it because when we go back to the oldest written sources that we have, this is in Sumer, what is now Iraq, 5,000 years ago, that's the start of history, before that is prehistory. Um, we find things like this. This is a clay tablet called a shubati, and which means I have given. Um, and on it you see in um, Akkadian scripts um, a debt contract. How much is owed, when it should be repaid, at how much interest, um, and, other, and other arrangements like in what, uh, in what kind it should be, should be paid, silver or grain. So I have given, Shubati, uh, which is the reverse of I owe you. This is an IOU, this is a debt contract, right? It's the oldest debt contract that we can look at probably. And we know that people use these debt contracts not just to record debts, but to pay each other. And that makes sense, because if I have a claim on you, it's you again, um, it means that I must pay you something, sorry, that you must pay me something, um, and if I have a debt contract for that, that's really worth something, that's a claim on goods and services. And if I need to pay you something, I can give you that claim on him, right? So you can pay me and I can pay you, but we can also settle. We can centralize this. There can be central clearing, okay? Moreover, we also know from, um, from studies of uh, society in Sumer 5,000 years ago that people didn't carry these clay tablets around. They kept them in the central temple state complex um, and they used them as means of payments, not by giving, the, giving them physically to each other, but by transferring ownership to clay tablets to each other, right? So instead of giving you the clay tablet, I could say, well, the clay tablet, Shubhati, which is in the temple, now belongs to you. Okay, and that, that must be recorded as well in some way. So you need a quite sophisticated legislation system, recording system, but in prehistory, uh, probably, in any case, in very early history. Um, they had double entry bookkeeping, they had credit and debts, um, they had central, central clearing, and you might think of the temples of those times as the central banks of those times, right? And we do still the same thing. When I go to the supermarket and pay, I don't physically give money most of the time, but I transfer part of my bank account to the shopkeeper, right? 
It's the same principle. So all those things which seem very modern are really 5,000 years old. Okay, now money is a form of debt, right? I just explained why debt and credit relations are the most fundamental relations that we have in our economy. Any seasonally dependent economy cannot function without credit and debt arrangements. That the tokens, the symbols for these arrangements came to be used as means of payment, which is logical. It's a lot more logical than picking up shells or using gold. Um, and that around this, you get a whole system which looks a lot like banking. Okay? And it's not just in Babylonia or Sumer, Mesopotamia, that credit tokens were used as means of payment. This is um, a tally stick. I'm not sure what it is in German. Anyone? A kerfstok in Dutch. Dutch is almost German, or the other way around, maybe. So maybe that triggers your memory. A, a tally stick is a stick of wood that people, uh, in any case in medieval times, were probably much earlier, but wood doesn't keep as long as clay, so we don't know. People used for payment. So there's the stick, and it is carved in both, on both, both sides, with cards indicating how much is, how much is owed, when it should be repaid, who is the owner, who is the creditor or the debtor, what is the interest if there is interest, and so on. Just the same principle. And then when that was carved, that stick was carved on both, both sides, the stick was split in the middle and the creditor took one half and the debtor took the other half. Yeah, so the hunter and the farmer, so to say. Um, and then you had the stick and the basis was called the stock. That's where the word stock market comes from. And um, people used these sticks to pay each other. Yeah, so again, it was not just a debt claim, but it was a means of payment. Big markets in uh, northern France, in the Low Countries, uh, in Germany, um, in Britain, were not, s not only markets to bring your cattle to and trade, but also to clear your tally sticks, right? So again, means of debt were, tokens of debt were used as means of payment. And into the 19th century, uh, tally sticks were used as means of payment in the whole of Northwest Europe. Yeah, this was quite normal. Now, there's many other archaeological evidences, um, pot charts from northern Italy, for instance, from the Etruscan people, to, to show that remarkably, across time and place, many different civilizations, um, economies run on credit and debt, and credit and debt tokens are used as means of payment. Okay, this is a bill of exchange, which is trade credit. It's credit that traders exchange among each other. Time and again, we see that that, that kind of credit arrangement comes to be used as a means of payment, as money. Okay, in our current money, we don't see this anymore. We don't see that this is, um, this is a debt token. If you take a British five pound note, uh, it still says, I promise to pay to the bearer of this note five pounds, signed by the cashier of the Bank of England. If you go and take that note to Threadneedle Street in London, where the Bank of England is, and you say, this is a five pound note, You've, well, this is a promise to pay five pounds, please give me five pounds, what will you get? Another five pound note. Right? So we don't really redeem these debt notes anymore, but it is still, this is where it comes from and this is what it means. Um, we have developed so far that we don't even use, uh, you might say, a physical medium anymore, like clay or gold or paper. Money is, is, yeah, it's the bits in the computer of your bank manager nowadays. It's not physical anymore. Yeah, well, even though computers are physical, are of course physical. Um, but, but you can't go to the bank and ask for your money. Your money is a few numbers in a computer. There's a lot of people who really worry about that, who say, this is not right, this is fraud. Where is my money? Okay? In the financial crisis in 2007, a lot of money, as they say, a lot of money evaporated from the market, as if it was water. How can money disappear? Well... That's quite normal now. Now you understand that this is quite normal. Think about the hunter and the farmer. They had an agreement. They just took a, um, they took a branch from a tree. They made it into a tally stick. And, and this was money. And the, the farmer could now walk away and use this tally stick to pay someone else. And they made this money out of nothing. 
Is that okay? Is that fraud? Um, well, in any case, um, it's the only way you can do it. Because this is a relationship, right? A creditor-debtor relationship. And it's a bit silly to ask where does relationships, where do relationships come from? Or when your relationship has ended, it's a bit silly to ask where has my relationship gone, right? You might ask where's my wife gone? That's maybe a very good question. Um, or my husband, but not where has my relationship gone? Because a relationship is an idea. Sorry, it's in Dutch here. It's an idea, not a thing. Okay? Uh, and they can appear and disappear. And that's what happens with money. That's why money appears out of nothing and disappears uh, when there is a financial crisis, for instance. Okay, so now we know what money is. This is not exclusive, an exclusive definition of money. Money is many other things as well. It's a, it is a means to reduce transaction costs. It is a store of value, but it's also debt. Okay? And I want to emphasize that money is still debt. We go on to how is money used? Well, money is still created out of nothing as it always was. And I'll illustrate that with a little example. This is the Utrechtse Fabriek. Um, that's Utrecht work. I told this story in Utrecht once, so I haven't changed the picture yet. I should at some point. Um, let's say this is the Meisel Brewery, um, and um, I'm going to, to brew a new beer, and um, I need a million euros to invest. Okay? Now, the definition of an entrepreneur is someone with a bright idea but no money, and the definition of a good bank, as you can read in the textbook, is... Well, the institution that provides entrepreneurs with money, who allocate money to the right users, okay? So if I go to the bank and I ask for a loan, and they think it's a good business plan, then they give me a million euros as a loan. What happens at that point? Do they wait till someone appears at the back door with a big bag full of euros, million euros? Ah, that's very fortunate because we have this entrepreneur here who wants to take out a loan and they take it to the front door uh, to the, uh, and they give it to me as a loan. No, that's not what happens. Okay, of course not. Uh, then what happens? Well, I have to probably sh identify myself. There will be some signing of papers and some punching of keynotes, uh, of notes, uh, keystrokes on a computer. But in the end, that's it. They, they give me a million euros uh, just by changing numbers in my bank account. So if my bank account was 10 euros with this bank, they say, we agree, and then it's a million and 10 euros. That's it. Banking is really simple. Okay? Um, I just told you, money, your money is just numbers in a bank account. So there's no one stopping a banker to change that, if you agree. Okay, it's an agreement between the debtor and the creditor. And a loan is, in effect, is a promise by the bank to pay your bills up to the amount of the loan. And the bank will now pay my bills up to a million euros. Um, I can go to someone who is going to build me a factory, a brewery, and, and say, well, build me a factory, and says, that's okay, give me 500,000 euros so that I can hire some people and buy inputs and so on. I said, that's okay, and I order the bank to transfer half of my million to another bank account, let's say in the same bank. And the bank just changes the numbers in my bank account to 500,010 euros, and the builder gets 500,000 euros. And then the builder employs some people, and he transfers the money, the bank transfers the money to bank accounts of his workers, and the workers go shopping, and the money is transferred to supermarkets, and so on. The money was first created, and now it circulates. It never leaves the bank. It's always in the bank account, but we say that it circulates in the economy. Okay? And the banks balance their books because the loan is an asset. For those of you who do accounting, the loan is an asset for them. It's a claim on me. Um, and they create that asset together with a liability, which is the deposit, the money. It's a liability to the bank because they have to provide the money to me on demand. Okay? So the books of the ban bank still balance. Assets and liabilities go up by the same amount. Money circulates in the economy. New activity is taking place. The economy expands. I make a profit. 15 people get a job, let's say. More beer is produced. All good outcomes, sure. Okay? This is how banking is supposed to work. The money stock expands. 
the economy expands, there doesn't have to be inflation in this whole story. That's how economic growth is supported by financial development. How can you have too much of this? Well, there's other ways that you can use money. This is um, a red Maserati. Um, you buy it, it costs you 222,000 euros. With my academic salary, I would be very hard pushed to uh, have that cash. So if I went to the bank and I said, I want to buy a red Maserati, could you do me, could you, could you do me a loan of uh, 200,000 euros and a bit more? Um, well, if I did that, let's say in 2005, then probably the bank's bank, banker would welcome me with a cup of coffee and say, well, I'm going to arrange that for you. If I do it now, um, they probably already start laughing when I just enter the door, uh, come through the door. And rightly so, because it's a very stupid loan. It's a stupid loan for me to take and for the bank to give. Because what's the difference with the factory? Well, the factory loan pays for itself. The money is invested in such a way that it generates income from which the loan can be repaid. If it was a good business plan and things work out as planned. Okay? And it's the bank's job to assess that at the start and monitor it when it's being executed. So let's call it a productive loan. Many economists have a problem with this word productive as if there were also unproductive loans. That's something most economists don't really agree with. Um, but productive loans pay for themselves. And in the process, they also generate employment and output. A consumption loan, like the Maserati, doesn't pay for itself. If I take the loan, I have to repay it from other sources of income, from my salary, let's say. So on a micro level, on my individual level, this is a dangerous thing because it's very unlikely that I will have additional sources of income all of a sudden, just because I bought a, Ma bought a Maserati. When I, uh, I roar away in my Maserati, I disappear around the corner, I already lost a third of the value, right? So how am I going to repay the loan with collateral on the loan, which is already worth a lot less? On the macro level, you might say, car loans and all other durable consumption good loans is a good idea. The whole car industry works on this kind of finance, right? Many people, maybe most people who buy a car, don't pay in the beginning. They pay over a long time. Same for fridges and you know all kinds of durable consumption goods. So on the micro level, consumption credit might still be a good idea, but it's, it's more dangerous than, than the first kind of loans. A third kind of loans is a mortgage. Mortgages are very common loans, even more common in my country than in yours. Um, the Dutch are uh, champions when it comes to taking on mortgage, mortgage loans. What happens with the mortgage loans? Um, basically the same thing as happens with the Maserati, but without the productive spillover effects. Most mortgages are given out for existing houses, not for, newly, for a new building. If it's, if it's for building new houses, you're back to the factory example, then it's a productive loan. If you um, take out a mortgage to buy an already existing house, uh, all that happens if, is that the debt increases. Let's say I take a mortgage for 500,000 euro, buy a very nice house. Um, then the ownership of that house transfers from, from the seller to me, um, and the debt in the economy goes up by half a million euros. Well, hold on, you might say, the seller gets 500,000 euros, okay? Yeah, but most people who sell a house buy a house, right? Almost everybody who sells a house buys another house for it because he, wanted, he or she wanted to move. And so this, this money circulates. If house prices are increasing, the debt is increasing, the increased amount of money is circulating in the real estate markets uh, without much else happening. Of course, if I buy a house, I might want new wallpaper or a new kitchen. Let's say this is 10,000 euros, 15,000 for a very nice kitchen. But compared to the 500,000 loan, this, this is peanuts. Okay, and the kitchen and the wallpaper generate new employment and output. But the 500,000 doesn't generate any or almost no output and employment. The debt increases, but the GDP doesn't increase. GDP, uh, Brutto Inland Product, is the measure for how big the economy is. It's the total of all incomes which are earned in an economy. Yeah? Now, 
the productive loan generates income, so GDP goes up and debt goes up. The debt burden is debt divided by GDP. That's debt for the macroeconomy, for the whole economy, relative to the income for the macroeconomy. Because the income must repay the debt. So it's the debt divided by the income from which the debt must be repaid. It's a good measure for a debt burden, not in euros, but in percent. For the productive loan, that doesn't have to go up. Both, both GDP and debt go up. For the consumption loan, that might also be the case. But because the debt and the income are on different balance sheets, the debt is for me, the income is for the Maserati dealer, there may be very dangerous situations there, mismatches. For mortgages, the debt goes up and the GDP does not go up. House prices go up, which is not GDP. Okay? Of course, house owners get wealthier, they feel richer, they are not richer until they sell their house, at least not rich in money. Um, but if they sell their house, they have to buy a new house probably, which is also more expensive. There are a few people who will sell their house and die maybe, that's very sad, or sell their house and start renting, so they will have a lot of money, but mostly um, you don't see that. And the same goes for loans by banks to non-bank financial institutions like um, pension funds and insurance funds who use money to invest. Okay? Also, this money is money which doesn't increase the GDP directly. It's invested in financial assets, just that the money for the mortgage was invested in a real estate asset. And assets is not income. Okay? So there's two kinds of debt. They're above the line. You have debt which which goes, in, which goes into the economy, credit which goes into the economy, and credit and debt is the same thing, just look at that from a different point of view. Um, and the debt burden is stable if you have this kind of credit. And you also have credit which goes to real estate and financial markets, and this causes um, a rise in debt. So I started by the question is, do we have too much finance? Do we have too much money? Well, money is a form of debt. When does debt go up? Well, it's not so interesting to look at the millions of euro or the billions of euros, but look at debt relative to GDP. When does debt go up? Well, when you get bank lending to real estate and financial markets. So we started with a very general question to which I got some fairly philosophical answers, and we get down to very specific answers here. When bank loans go to real estate and financial markets, the debt burden goes up the private debt burden. All the time I'm talking about private debt, not government debt. Okay? So when do we have too much of it? I've now answered that question. Well, no, I haven't. I've said, when do, do we have much debt? But what is too much? That's a very hard question. Um, let me first show you that what I'm saying is not just theoretical reasoning, although we all like theoretical reasoning, of course. It's the basis of our thinking, but when we take this idea to the data, and this is the American flow of fund statistics, which go back all the way to 1952. So here you're you are looking at 60 years of financial history of the United States. And I've looked at all the lending by American banks and other financial institutions to American firms and households. Okay, all the debt. And I've split up the debt um, according to this well, according to this categorization. So there's, there's total debt, which is the black line, which goes up from about 100% of GDP, so just as big as the economy in 1952. This is the US coming out of the war with very low levels of private debt. And then you see the black line increasing very slowly and very steadily until um, the 1980s. President Reagan, financial liberalization, especially in the financial markets, then it goes crescendo. It goes, uh, you have exponential growth from the early 80s uh, until the 90s. Then there is a stagnation again. There was a, uh, a difficult time in the world economy in the early 90s. And then it goes, goes up again. And then it goes to a peak in 2007, right? So this is the growth of private debt in the US as a percentage of GDP. You can break that down, that black line, into its two constituent components, which is credit to the finance and property sectors, property is the same as real estate, and credit to what's sometimes called the real sector, which means non-financial business and also consumer credit, but most of it is credit to firms, 
That's the way we think about banks in textbook stories. Banks make loans to firms. Well, that's the blue line. And you can see that the blue line is indeed remarkably stable. It's completely flat, allowing for some statistical discrepancies until um, the mid-1980s. Then it moves to a higher level, a higher plateau, um, probably because of financialization. That's a different story. But again, it's flat until 2006, financial crisis, and then it starts moving up and down again. I think you have nominator, denominator problems there. GDP was falling in a financial crisis, so we shouldn't trust the latest bit too much. But overall, we see indeed uh, the blue line is, is flat, around 100% of GDP. Uh, that GDP is, debt to GDP is stable over 60 years when it goes to the real sector, when there are productive loans. But when we look at credit to financial and real estate markets, well, that's rising. And oh, practically, in fact, all of the rise in total debt is due to this debt to real estate and financial markets. Okay? So there's really two kinds of debt when you look at the effect on the debt burden. You might almost say there's almost two kinds of money. There's money that's used for transactions in goods and services for the real economy, and then there's money also created by banks, just in the same lending process as the other kind of money, but there's money to real estate and financial markets, which has very different effects on debt levels and on debt burdens. Now, um, is this the economy we know from the textbooks? How can, I mean, look at this. Does this look like an equilibrium to you? If you study economics, you must know the word equilibrium. Yes. So I have a question. Um, do you know how it was before? I mean, before 1950? No. Under the Bretton Woods system and so on? This is the Bretton Woods system <laughs> until. Uh, until the 70s, or then do you think it's related to the, to the stock? Yeah, there is, a, there, is, there, is a, there is a Bretton Woods influence as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is this the economy we know from the textbook, right? This doesn't look like an equilibrium to me. Debt levels increasing over 60 years. They're not stabilizing, you know, around some level. Um, there's not an invisible hand. That's Adam Smith over there, right? The grandfather of economics. Um, there's not something like an invisible hand which stabilizes debt level at some, some stable level over time relative to the economy, let alone in euros. Um, and we know that's Kenneth Arrow. Uh, he did a lot of work on Adam Smith's basic notion that a multi-market multi -market economy will be in equilibrium and that this equilibrium delivers the best, the best possible outcomes. And among other things, he showed there's a lot of exceptions to that to do with public goods, etc. Um, that's Joseph Stiglitz, uh, a recent Nobel Prize winner. And um, he showed the same thing for asymmetric information problems. I'm, there's no time to go deeply into that, or to go into that at all, actually. But he quipped quite cheekily, saying that, well, the reason that the invisible hand is invisible, maybe, because he's not there. Things which don't exist are also invisible. So are we really in an economy which tends to, towards an equilibrium? Um, I think not. I think fundamentally not. And in order to understand that, we need another economist, and that's Hyman Minsky. Um, Hyman Minsky has become well known for the financial instability hypothesis. And in this he explained the picture that I just showed to you, that debt is going up over time, all the time. Um, the financial instability hypothesis is, is, is a really deep insight. And basically Minsky devoted his entire working life, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, to this one idea, right? So talking about obsessed people, Minsky was an obsessed man. Uh, we can only be thankful that he was, probably his wife, his wife wasn't. This is the insight. Mass psychology plus leveraged asset markets lead to crisis. Minsky said, the economy is not, there's no innate, no inherent tendency to equilibrium in the economy. There's an inherent tendency to instability in the economy. That's exactly the opposite of what you read in textbooks. Why is that? Well, it is because we use money. Minsky said. What is money? If you've got money in your pocket, it means that you've postponed spending, or it wouldn't be in your pocket. Money is something that you can spend in the future. Okay? Therefore, in economies which are monetized, where money is used, 
people, and especially investors, have to be forward-looking. You have to, you're going to spend that money in the future. You have to form an idea about what you're going to spend it on. And you have to form expectations. Minsky was a student of Keynes. He, uh, he studied Keynes. He studied also with Schumpeter. He wrote a book about Keynes. Expectations is a very important concept for Keynes and also for Minsky. Um, what do we know about expectations? Well, expectations are psychological constructs, right? And they are subject to, for instance, overshooting. Experiments show that people are always a bit more optimistic than is really warranted by the facts. Okay, maybe it helps you in prehistory to hunt for woolly mammoths. Uh, you would never do that if you knew the facts about hunting woolly mammoths, but if you're over-optimistic, you do it. Maybe there's an evolutionary advantage to it. I don't know anything about that. Anyway, people are overly optimistic. People are also social beings. They're, they're herding. They imitate each other. When investors take investment decisions, they may study figures, they may make, make complicated sums, but most of all, they look the other way and say, what is the other guy doing? They look at each other and they imitate each other. If you have over optimism if you have over optimism and hurting, that results in investing too much and together. If one mar market is attracting money, many investors will imitate that and the investment will probably be, probably be more than can be warranted by the objective productivity gains in that market. Okay? Um, now there's a problem there because you could say, well, um, you may want to invest too much, but how do you know you can invest too much? You can only invest so much. Well, this is where money comes in. Money is not a thing. Money is not wood or clay or gold. Money can be created out of nothing. Because banks create credit, because we create credit together with banks, we can realize these over-investment plans. We can just create money and invest, okay? So unlike physical markets, there is no physical limit to how much money can be invested in financial markets, in, in dot-com stocks or in real estate. Real estate are also financial markets in this respect. Okay, so there are limits to how many chairs I can export to China, supposing the Chinese wanted uh, chairs from me. The market will be saturated, the wood uh, may be running out. There are physical limits to that, but there are no physical limits to financial investments. Okay? Well, here you have it. Each of these seven steps is pretty much universal to humankind. At least to people living in financial capitalist societies, which nowadays covers almost the whole world. North Korea accepted. So, mass psychology and leverage asset markets result in bubbles. And after that, in busts. I'm not going to talk you through the bust that will follow the bubble when the expectations are not, are not uh, becoming reality in the end. But of course, then you'll have a bust. And then things cool down until the next bubble. This is how capitalism works. This is the tendency in capitalism towards instability. Right? You go from um, a rise in asset prices if people start pouring money into a market, asset prices will rise. If we all take out mortgages because we believe house prices are going to rise, house prices will rise because a finite stock of real estate, money flowing into it results in rising prices per house. Yeah, Self-fulfilling prophecy, you might say. Um, asset prices which rise give rise to capital gains. You sell something, you sell it more expensively, you make a capital gain. Um, that means we become more greedy, and be we become less cautious. That, become, that means we want to borrow more to, to do it again, and we tell our neighbors, and they also want to do it, um, and there we are. Okay? And therefore, the famous quote to, to, to um, summarize what, what Minsky said is that stability is destabilizing. Stability is destabilizing. I need, to, uh, I need to hurry up here. If you live in stable times where things are going well, you're making capital gains, everything's going smooth, you want to do just a bit, little bit more. You think times will be better. And that tendency is destabilizing. That leads to the bubble and then to the bust. 
And according to Minsky, typically then government and banks will step in when there is a financial problem or the, the threat of a financial crisis or an actual crisis to save creditors and to stabilize the system. Okay? And that's why every business cycle in the last 60 years, 60 years that we have data for starts on a higher level of debt. It doesn't return to the same level of debt. There is no equilibrium. It starts on a higher level of debt. And if we went further back, we would probably see the same tendency. The Second World War was one way to erase a lot of debt. Um, the 1929 crash was another way to do it. Then we have to go back to the turn of the century for another crash, but major financial crashes and wars are the ways in which debt is reduced, not by the market. Okay, well, where does that leave us? That leaves us with a very general account of understanding when we have too much money, namely when we have too much debt. Namely, when we let this, you might say, natural process, which is innate to financial capitalism, when we let it run its course. This is the same picture for the states that we had for the states for the Netherlands. Uh, I only have publicly available data which go back to 1990, unfortunately, but you see the same tendency. Um, I looked it up for Germany for you, and you see Germany is in a much better shape. Actually, Germany is a, un it, Germany is a unique country. You already knew that, of course, being German most of you, but it's also unique because uh, it didn't have a housing bubble um, after the war. Yeah? So after the hyperinflation of Weimar and so on, Germans have been very prudent. And you can see that there is no such big rise in debt to GDP in Germany. You can even see that it peaked around 2002 and already then is, is going down. But that's a pretty rare picture. That's a pretty rare picture. So I think one needs to understand Germany better to understand what's going on here. Um, if you compare it to the amount of money, you can see that the Germans have used their six-fold increase in money, just the same as in the US. Germans have used that money in a very different way, in a much more productive way, so that both GDP and debt were going up, and not just the debt. Now, I'm, I was going to show you some um, of my research about this, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'd rather go on to some policy implications. One of the consequences of this has been very high household debt because mortgages is the biggest category of debt growth and of course it's the biggest reason why debt to GDP levels are going up. The Netherlands uh, is the one but highest indebted country when it comes to households among all OECD countries. Denmark is just a bit higher. Germany is in a very safe place there, as you can see. Um, but why should, we, why should we worry about this, right? So we've now understood why it happens. That's Minsky's theory. But you might still ask, well, is it too much? I mean, how do you know it's too much? If, if, if the U.S. could go on like this for 60 years, they can maybe go on for another 60 years. You know, if I had told this story in the 1990s, I might have told you this cannot go on for another 10 years. And it did go on for another 10 years. You never know that. How do we, well, we don't know when it's exactly it is too much, but we do now know some of the consequences of very high levels of debt. One consequence um, is more instability, and you wouldn't be surprised. This is not typically what has happened in, uh, in Western Europe or in the States until the great financial crisis of 2007. Actually, we were experiencing something called the great moderation, the great moderation very low levels of volatility of GDP growth, low levels of inflation, stable inflation. But that's, that's not typical. On average, over many countries and years, including non-European non countries, you can see that the standard deviation of growth, that's how much GDP growth wobbles over time, that standard deviation is going down as on the horizontal axis, the amount of credit divided by GDP is going up. So more financial development, more stability. That's what the textbooks would actually tell you. If you have more ability to save and more ability to take loans and to insure yourself all these financial services, uh, you can smooth your consumption. You can already buy a house instead of waiting until you're 70 and, you're, and you have saved enough. So that stabilizes things. That's what you would expect. But, but beyond the point, the curve goes up again, around 100%. 
rise, the curve goes up again. So you get more instability. And that's because of Minsky's boom-bust dynamic. Second, you get lower income growth. And by now, this should be completely unsurprising. If you invest more in real estate and financial markets and less in what I call productive purposes, factories and so on, of course you get less income growth. But we actually see that. Here you see um, on the horizontal axis time and on the vertical axis we've estimated, this is from a paper that we published earlier this year, we estimated the correlation between credit over GDP levels and growth, that's GDP per capita growth per year. And you see that correlation is trending downwards over time uh, since the 1980s, since the financial liberalizations of the 1980s. Um, it also leads to longer recessions. Let me not talk you in detail through this. It leads to more inequality. Here you see uh, one measure for inequality in the US from US census data. The top five divided by the bottom 20% of income earners. So the higher this measure, the higher inequality is. And the red line is bank credit to finance and property. It's the same red line that I showed you earlier. You, can, you see they go up together, right? Now, this is just a correlation, or rather it's just a picture. It doesn't show anything. But there's also a research. Actually, I'm going to talk tomorrow at a conference here about financial development and inequality in Europe. And, and, and there is a link, right? It's not just a correlation. Uh, less investment, which makes sense if you don't productively invest credit, you get less investment. This is for international financial flow. So, concluding in the last part, I want to go and say something about, well, what should we do now? But we should realize that we live in very confused times. Um, I don't know about here, actually, but in my country, the mood is quite optimistic. Uh, this is my prime minister, Mark Rutte, and this summer, he's always smiling. Uh, this summer, he said, uh, ik heb ook beloofd Nederland sterker uit de crisis te halen, en dat is ons ook wel gelukt. And in English, that is, I've promised to get the Netherlands stronger out of the crisis of 2007, he means, uh, and I actually succeeded. Okay, and the bottom guy looks a bit more worrying. Well, he's a bit older, of course, but um, that's Claudio Borio. He's uh, a very well-known economist from the Bank of International Settlements. And um, they published a report in the same summer, last summer, which uh, says, well, we have debt levels which are too high, which are part of a risky trinity, productivity growth that is too low, and very little that we can do if things go wrong, very little room for policy maneuver. So in what sort of world do you live? In Marco Rutte's world or in Claudio Borio's world? These are very confusing times. Well, suppose that we want to do something about this. What are the options? Okay, of course I'm not the only person who's noted that debt levels are very high, that the financial system doesn't seem to deliver stability, growth, equality. All these things were expected from the financial system. The financial system was supposed to contribute to all these aims. Instead, the financial system is now so large that we have less stability due to a too large financial system, therefore too much money creation which goes into unproductive purposes, which leads to too high debt burdens. We have lower growth and lower investment and more inequality. What can you do about that if you want to do something about it? Well, first you must share my diagnosis, of course. And uh, this is still very contestable. There is a debate about how should we think about the role of the financial sector. That's why it's such a great time to be an economist researching this. But if you want to do something about it, here's a number of things which different sets of people say we should do. And then it's over to you to discuss this, to question me, to criticize this, to think about your own solutions if you have them. The first solution that I'll turn to is the official solution of the ECB. That means low interest rate and asset purchases. That's, that's how the ECB and the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England um, and the Bank of Japan for a longer time already have been trying to stabilize an economy with very high levels of private debt. Make interest rates very low because then the debt burden, the debt servicing can still be quite low. Um, and buy assets because the danger after a bubble is that asset prices, which have gone up, will go down again, and the bubble bursts. Well, if you start buying those assets, there is demand for those assets, they may stay up, and we may muddle on for a bit, bit longer. Interest rates are uh, zero now. They're, they're even going to be negative, probably. 
Um, the, just the other week, I was at a meeting at a bank in the Netherlands, ENG, uh, and they were very worried about it. So they got together a number of professors and bankers to talk about this, and nobody actually knows what, what we're going to do, what sort of territory we're going into. And here you see the balance sheet of the European Central Bank, which has ballooned, you know. We are, we are doing things which we have never done before. Um, the Bank of England started this in 2009. It's called quantitative easing, uh, credit easing, quantitative easing. The blue line there is bank loans to the private sector. And the worrying thing, of course, after 2008 was that banks were not lending to the economy anymore. So that line was trending, had topped and was trending downwards. The response was quantitative easing to increase the reserves of banks by buying assets from banks. This is going to be a little bit technical. But by increasing reserves of banks, the hope was that banks would use these reserves to make more loans. This wasn't happening, as you see. So quantitative easing, in that sense, hasn't worked to get growth in the economy going again. That's central bank policy solution. A second solution is to change um, the architecture of our international financial system. We are in Euroland, in the Eurozone, and the banking union is the biggest idea here, the biggest recent idea. And um, I, I, there's no time to explain what the banking union is, but one of the advantages would be that banks can be regulated in a more uniform way within the whole Eurozone rather than uh, national sovereign governments having to regulate and to save their banks, okay? Because this is actually, this has basically caused the euro crisis. Um, but even with, um, with a banking union, which, which we have for some time now, we can see that, that capital is still flowing out of Southern Europe and towards Northern Europe. So capital which was flowing to, this is the same story that I told, but on an international scale, capital which was flowing to, with hindsight you have to say, unproductive purposes, to Southern Europe, uh, Deutsche Bank, ING, Rabobank, Swedish banks, Austrian banks, were all investing heavily in real estate markets in Spain, in consumption in Greece, and so on, unproductively, and they are now repatriating their money, and of course rich Greek people are doing the same, so you see this, these target two balances show this, that there's a widening gap and there's money flowing from south to north, which is a bursting of the bubble. How long can we postpone that, even with the banking union? Okay, those are the official, the, the policy responses. Here's a third response, which has been very popular for a long time, for 5,000 years actually, and longer probably. A debt jubilee. I told you in the beginning about Sumer, Mesopotamia. Um, in Mesopotamia, they did have debt jubilees. So when a new king or emperor came to the throne, one way to celebrate was that he said, hey, all your debts are forgiven. And that was, uh, of course, good news. Uh, things were quite simple in that time because most of the debts that he talked about were public, were not public debts, but were debts which were owed to the king. So if you can forgive debts which are owed to you, you're the only one who suffers, so it's co relatively uncomplicated to say that. If you do the same thing now, you know, through our pension systems, we've all invested in other people's debts and so on. So if you would nullify debts now, there would be a lot of uh, creditors, a lot of people owning those debts, investing in it, who suffer from it. Uh, how are you going to compensate them? Is that fair? And so on and so on. But um, there has been a jubilee movement in the West for a long time already. In 2000, they had a big manifestation, but it's a very, a very old idea. So there you see a Torah scroll, uh, the, uh, this is old Jewish financial legislation, um, because Mesopotamia or Sumer wasn't the only ancient society doing this. Ancient societies recognize that debt tends to grow faster than the economy, so periodically you have to annul the debt, you have to clear the debt overhead away to get the economy going again. We've replaced that by, by continuous regulation, of the financial sector and of debt until the 1980s, and then we liberalized it, so we were back to the ancient scenario of unfettered growth of debt. Well, then you also have to clear away the debt now and then, but we don't do that, because debt uh, forgiveness is politically completely unacceptable. Even forgiving the debt to Greece, when everybody already knows they're never going to repay that debt, is completely unacceptable. N nobody can talk about it. So we stick to business as usual. That's another piece of legislation. It's a legal notice that Americans find on their door when they don't pay their mortgage. 
But debt is a debt. We keep debts in place. The debtor suffers. The creditor doesn't. That's, that's legislation that we have, which may work well in normal times. The question is, are these normal times? Next solution, revamp our money. We need a different kind of money. Maybe bitcoins instead of bank money don't suffer from all the problems that we have. Maybe let's local exchange trading systems where we give each other vouchers for local services. Anyone here member of a let's group? Nobody? Okay, read up about LED. Um, there are a lot of them, and many people believe that if you can strengthen your local economy by creating local money, uh, you circumvent the moloch of the international financial system, and you build more resilient economies where more of the value stays in the local economy. Okay, and is used more productively in the terms that I introduced. Um, then some people go even further. Uh, who ever heard of Joseph Huber? Joseph Huber, some people do, Professor Huber. Um, there he is, that's the, that's the gray guy. Vollgeld, 100% money, debt-free money. It co comes under different names. Um, there's the organization Positive Money in the UK. This is uh, the foundation Ons Geld in the Netherlands. Um, I don't know what the, whether there is a club here in Germany which promotes these ideas, I suppose there is. So they say, look, this whole story that money is created as debt by banks, that's the problem. We need money which is not debt, right? We must, we must make a separation between money and debt. And therefore we need the, the government, not, not profit-driven banks, but the government to create money and spend it into the economy so that we have money to run the economy with without debt which is growing. Of course, private individuals might still lend and borrow to and from each other, but you don't have this growth of debt with the growth of money. Okay? That's the basic idea. A lot of people think a lot of this idea. Martin Wolf of the Financial Times, whom I showed in the beginning, is, uh, is quite interested in it. Next month, I will be part of a meeting in Amsterdam where a lot of people, including Martin Wolf, will meet. Uh, Michael Kumhoff, uh, others will meet to discuss this idea and other ideas for monetary reform. Okay? To me, it's a very strange idea, let me be frank. I mean, I told you about how money has always been debt in prehistory. So it's like making dry water, debt-free money. I mean, how can you make debt-free money? Money is a form of debt. Um, and then another solution is, is what Minsky suggested, is to have a partial debt reset. So some of the debt must be reduced and written off, and this will hurt creditors. We must, ha must have permanent banking regulation. Well, nowadays that's very popular. Banks are completely over-regulated now, arguably. But you must also have that regulation in the next bubble times because they will come. In my country, there is already a real estate bubble going on. And there's a lot of pressure for deregulation already. Okay? Minsky said you must continually <coughs> regulate banks because bubbles and bursts are inherent in financial capitalism. It's not, not an aberration. It's not a mistake. It's a structural feature. And you must have government spending programs because if the government has deficits, then the private sector doesn't have to be deficits, doesn't have to go into debt so much, and you can still have economic growth. There's much more to be said about that. Okay. Um, well, I've talked for longer than I planned to talk, and uh, it's admirable that you're still not asleep, and most of you are still paying attention, at least given the impression. But it's high time that you, uh, you chipped in now. And ask me questions and give your, your thoughts about this. There's a microphone here. So who wants to start? So, sorry, it needs to be recorded, right? I will, I will repeat the question for now until the microphone works, yeah? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. Naive questions are the best questions, right? The question of what is money, you know, it helps a lot. 
uh, yeah, so just like there's no physical limit or whatever to how much money banks can create, there is no limit to how large the balance sheet of the, the ECB can be. At least not, not a physical limit or something. If we together agree that they should stop, or if uh, the prime ministers of the, uh, or the finance ministers agree that, that they should stop, then they will stop, but there is no, no limits now. Yeah. There are side effects, of course, but there's no limit, no wall that they will run into or something. Would this, would this affect then the, the bond market, for example? So yeah, yeah. Investors will um, charge higher interest for the bonds, for the, let's say the German bonds or so? No, I mean, uh, companies who issue bonds, you mean government bonds? Yes, government bonds. Yeah. yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Because they do this. Um, the yields on bonds of southern European countries are still are still not not very high, so they don't have to pay a lot of uh, interest on their bonds on their borrowing because of these actions. That's probably one of the reasons to prevent a euro crisis, another euro crisis. Yeah. Uh, for your part, another euro crisis during on the last banking crisis, uh, some uh, economic commentators and uh, newspapers have warned. Are you asking how dangerous is what exactly? The real estate bubble in the Netherlands, um, the European economy. It's probably quite risky, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that's also what the president of the Dutch Central Bank, Klaas Knots, says. Yeah. And I, I actually share that. Yeah. So you don't share your PM's optimistic view? No. Say it again, isn't that a...? Isn't that just a subsidy? Okay, so the question is, if the government spends, isn't that just a subsidy? Okay. Um, well, the government spends on taxes, okay? So it, it gets taxation from us, and it gives out subsidies to us, plus it employs a lot of people, which is not a subsidy, but a wage. Um, and, it, and it invests, and therefore it allows companies to make profit on that. So in, in many different ways, the economy... Uh, the, the government puts money into the economy. And if it puts more money into the economy than it drains from the economy by taxing, then on net it is spending, it's running a deficit, it's spending into the economy. That may be subsidies, but it may also be uh, productive investment, it may also be civil servant wages, it can be different things. Yeah, it could be something new. Yeah. The government doesn't have to earn taxes before it can spend. The government can also uh, issue bonds, which is liability, so borrow. The government can borrow and spend. Yeah, and also, in that case, it would not be new money because it would be money attracted from investors who invest in bonds. Yeah, and the government can actually also create its own money. It has an account with the central bank. The central bank can create money. The government can spend it into the economy without borrowing and without taxing. But that's uh, legally forbidden uh, under, under the Maastricht Treaty. So the government cannot borrow from its own central bank in this country. In some other countries, they can. Uh, one and two. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. To which extent, maybe is there some evidence that we can see something of what you have explained to us is going on right now in China, 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, fortunately, I, we published an article about China last month. So we looked into this over the last year. Uh, China has a real estate bubble, as we know, and, and also other. So China has become, since the 80s, uh, a completely fully capitalist country. And so they suffer from the same problems that Minsky described. Very simple. And of course, there, there, are di there are differences. For instance, in the West, in the Western countries, debt problems are driven mostly by household debt, household mortgage debt. In many Asian economies, uh, you see also household debt rising, but also business debt is often used unproductively in the sense that the debt is rising faster than business income. And Not just China. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, that makes it mo a lot more complicated. It means that it's much harder. I mean, the sort of statistics that are used here for the Netherlands and Germany and the US, you have those statistics for China, but it's very difficult to interpret what they mean. Um, there is there, so there are state-owned banks. In, in principle, they are no different from private banks. If they create money and that, that you get the same dynamic. Um, but there's also a lot of foreign money inflow into China which is uh, probably much larger than we see in the official statistics. A lot of uh, export earnings, for instance, aren't really export earnings, but are investment in the real estate markets. There's a lot of evidence that this is the case, but there's no good statistics on that. So, of course, the whole financial system and the international environment in China is very different uh, from other countries, and you would have to study that before you can say something. But you see the same, something specific, but you see the same dynamic, for sure. Yeah. Uh, there was another question there, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, this is this is actually quite difficult to think your way through, and there are different possible scenarios. Uh, the scenario I sketched was in which uh, existing houses are traded. Right. It's just as if we have something here, you know, say a house in our hand, and we trade it to each other each time at a higher price. Right? And every person who buys a house needs to borrow a little bit more because they sold a house for 100, they buy a house for 150. And if this is going on all the time, everybody is lending all the time. Everybody, everybody, I mean, at every transaction, someone is also making money all the time. If I sell a house for 100, and sorry, if I sell a house for 150, and I go to the next round when houses have become 200, then I must also borrow. Yeah. So this is assets um, which which don't which are not depleted, which don't disappear, which are not consumed. Unlike cars, which are consumed, they are durable consumer goods. After ten years, at the most probably, for most cars, uh, the car is gone, and you have to buy a new one. So the difference between assets and goods and services, on the other hand, um, is that assets are are. Um, stay in the market that's that's probably the best way the best way to put it and if you have uh, an, an increasing asset market mean rising house prices more and more money can circulate in that market you can change hands in the transactions um, and that will pay for the increasing asset prices but nothing else needs to happen no higher incomes are being earned because of that just everybody has to pay more debt service from the same income and that's why it's a problem in the long term. It is quite a complicated thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes.
is that the leaves work out, um, especially because this depends on the willingness of the lander. And if, if the government steps in, um, wouldn't this create an unsecurity uncertain for the for, for creditors to lend money? So the question is, how does a partial debt reset work? And the second question is, doesn't this create, could you say it again? Yeah, 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 right. So this is a common objection to debt jubilees or debt recess that, well, if you forgive debt, then okay, I want to lend as well next time because it will be forgiven anyway. Um, you can do it in different ways and you must be very much aware of this problem and avoid it. Um, for instance, um, what you could do is to, um, what happened in the last real estate crisis in the Netherlands, which was in 1979, 80, um, it was on a much smaller scale then and much more manageable, but the government could buy up mortgages, problem mortgages, and uh, keep them in, a, let's say, bad loans in a bad bank for a while until the real estate market has recovered. Uh, house prices now are again above levels of 2008, and then sell them again. Okay, so the government wouldn't have to spend money on that. It wouldn't have to tax other people to do this. Um, while the government or a government institution or a public-private institution, right, if private par parties see there's money in this, they could do this. How you treat the people who hold the mortgage meanwhile, well, you give them a holiday from paying interest or reduced interest or more time to pay, whatever, you, that, that is up for negotiation. And this is what happens normally when people get into debt problems. The creditors try to find a way to allow people still to pay without problems because that's also in their interest. But formally, this is a partial debt reset because you, you change the rules. You say, well, you don't have to repay as we agreed this interest then and then. We're going to change that so that it can still be done or part of it can still be done and everybody benefits from that. Um, second question, doesn't that uh, create moral hazards? Um, yeah, but if you make the conditions unattractive enough, nobody will want to do that, right? People who get into debt problems now, uh, who get official help from uh, government institutions to help people who are deeply into consumer debt, for instance, they will help you to repay your debt. They will probably forgive some of your debt, try to reach a settlement with your creditors, but you can probably um, um, you can not, not spend what you want for a number of years. You are under financial... Uh, that you have a you have a financial parent, a financial warden for a number of time, which is not a, a pretty uh, pretty experience. So it, if you make it like that, then then there is no incentive to do it on purpose. So yeah, you have to design it well. The devil is in the detail here. There's another question in the back, maybe two, uh, one and two. Okay, so the question here is if we follow the Volgeld idea, specifically about that idea, right? Don't you get a problem that people lose their trust in money? Okay, well, the idea is, as I described, that the government creates money and spends it into the economy through government spending, for instance, or in other ways, uh, instead of banks creating money and giving it out as loans. That's a very crude way, and probably if positive money people heard me talking now, they would say, no, 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 it's very different, but that's what I understand. because it, But it's a very comp there are very complicated plans about that, but that's the basic idea. Um, I myself have problems seeing how this would work, and I think there's a number of inconsistencies in there. 
But okay, let's say that the government can create money which is not debt and just give it out to people um, in return for whatever as, as wages or as investment and that it can circulate in the economy in this way. Your second question is, doesn't that undermine trust in money? And I don't quite see that. I mean, if we trust money which is created by banks, why wouldn't we trust money created by our government? Do we trust banks more than the government? No, I don't. Ah, yes. Okay. So in these plans, there's also when I say government, that's next. That's actually not correct. There should be a, a public institution which is not the government, a sort of fourth power. So we have the trias politica, the, the three powers of a democratic state now, um, any state, by the way. And, and so there should be a fourth monetary power in these plans, at least some versions of these plans, which is not subject to um, electoral considerations or politicking and so on. So that's, that's a valid concern. Yeah. Um, one and two. And, and when do we give that up? If we reset the debt. Yeah, well, as I just explained, if you are going to, um, uh, to reset debt, you have to do it under such conditions that it doesn't become attractive to lend in order to, ha in order to have a debt annulment later on, right? And if you make the conditions onerous enough, if you make it unattractive enough, that might work. So that's that's indeed a, that's indeed a concern. That is that is a big problem there. Yeah, one and two, maybe. Um, Chairman, can we? We had that um, rising housing bubbles and real estate bubbles would be a problem. I was wondering whether there's an easy way to to stop the dynamic of rising bubbles before they burst, like breaking the cycle we, we saw. Yeah, um, technically that. Yeah. 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 So technically, that's extremely easy, extremely simple. Um, it's actually something you do in Germany all the time. Uh, yeah, that's the word Baubeleg. <laughs> if you start saving for your house very early on, and if you buy a house with only only 50, 60, or 70 percent borrowing relative to the value of the house, uh, you don't get bubbles. But in the Netherlands, more than 100 percent of the value of the house was actually borrowed in the end of the bubble. Uh, so, so leverage, leverage is the big thing. That's debt relative to the value of the assets. If you can borrow the entire value of the asset or even more, yeah, that's how you blow up asset prices very rapidly. So technically, it's, it's very simple to stop bubbles. But that, I mean, that's a genius of Minsky's work. He describes how the bubble is also a, a mass psychology phenomenon. Everybody who starts making capital gains or sees prospects for more economic growth or whatever will start pushing for it. Now in the Netherlands, there, so the, the, the loan-to-value ratio has been reduced recently, and there's now lobbying to get it up again. Okay, so, that, so the idea is that young people can borrow, otherwise young people cannot borrow. If they have to bring in 10% of the value of the house, who can save that? So there's always very nice arguments, but everybody gets in, and it's a, it's a social phenomenon. It's not a technical phenomenon, because technically it's very easy to prevent bubbles. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah, so what I'm telling here, the story I'm telling here is a theoretical story, making a theoretical distinction between productive and unproductive loans. That's when you go and take it to the real world, it's very difficult. You can easily think of examples. Uh, a house, 
I mean, it's the best example, of course. Uh, everybody wants to live in a house. It's productive in the sense that it helps you to build your human capital, if that's the way you want to call it, okay? Especially if you raise children. Um, but there is this speculative element to real estate markets, and the speculative part of it is what I call unproductive. So I think it's useful to make the distinction in theory, even though we know that when we want to observe it and measure it, we, there is a gray area where we can't, we can't precisely be sure. That's actually the case with most uh, theoretical constructs, or for that matter, most uh, theoretical notions um, are very hard to define, right? Think about the concept of love. It is, uh, there's a lot of gray areas where you don't know exactly what it is, but it doesn't mean that you say it doesn't exist, right? Uh, that's maybe a bit far-fetched. Um, the other question was, so shouldn't we agree on clearly unproductive um, investments that they should be illegally banned? And, and sometimes they are, like a Ponzi scheme, a pyramid game. It's, it's a fraud. We agree that in, financial, in legislation we say this is forbidden. That's a Ponzi scheme. No. Real estate markets look a lot like Ponzi schemes in a bubble. Yeah, if we agreed as a society that we don't want this, we could, uh, we, could legis we could legislate it. But first, you need to have that agreement. That's why we're here tonight. There's more. more. Shall we just go on? Or uh, some people want to leave? Feel free to leave because we're running maybe late, but there's also lots of questions. So uh, you should be a very strict chairman now. Okay. Yeah, go on. Sorry, then I, I, then I missed your question. I thought you were describing this. This just means what it means. It's, it just says, what is the level of debt in uh, trillions of dollars divided by the level of GDP in, in trillions of dollars? It just says that when this black line is going up, it means that debt grows faster than GDP. That's all. It's, it's, uh, it's going up in euros. It's increasing sixfold since 1980 in euros. But it's flat. It's not increasing as a share of GDP. So it's increasing just as fast as the GDP. Uh, well, the, the publication I showed you in the start, uh, Too Much Finance, remember, is from uh, a university in Geneva, a research institute in Geneva, by mainstream economists, I think. You would call them mainstream if you want to make that distinction. Uh, so, yeah, this is talked about in mainstream economics. Uh, the explanation I gave here of Minsky uh, is, is not mainstream economics. Um, there's a number of universities in Europe and in the States which have attention to the work of Minsky um, and to what you could call post-Keynesian economics, so economics which builds on the insights of Keynes to understand the interaction between financial and real parts of the economy, which you don't find in undergraduate textbooks probably nowadays, but which is um, a minority, but, but um, it's a school of thought in, in economics in a number of universities. Quite rare, I think, also in Germany. Yes. Sorry, I need to get closer to hear you. The Tobin tax. Yeah, the Tobin tax is a tax on transactions um, of 
uh, transactions in financial assets, right? We have, a, we have a tax on transactions in goods and services. That's a value-added tax. And if you have a tax on transactions in assets, you make it less attractive uh, to trade assets. Um, some financial assets are trading, traded thousands of times per day. How are you going to tax that? So I, I can see the idea, but the implementation um, may be a problem. I think there are easier ways, namely to reduce leverage. Okay, we take this question. The last, last question. <laughs> I think one uh, reason for the boom of um, real estate prices in the United States was that, mm. for example, a lot of German money mm. uh, was flowing into the United States because Germany is running since 2000 uh, a really, really high surplus in the current account. And so they are obliged to export their capital into uh, the world. So is there, is there a link or did you already do some research about that? Yeah, so you're absolutely correct. The question here is, well, your whole story is a domestic story. I didn't say the world international or capital flows or well, briefly with the target to balances or, or exchange rates. So, yeah, this is explained in the uh, domestic economy, but I think you can transpose the logic to the international settings where also international capital flows can go and, and blow up real estate bubbles or consumption bubbles, and this is quite, quite common, actually. So you can, you can apply the same reasoning. But certainly, I haven't talked too much about the financing of real estate bubbles, um, which doesn't have to be domestic credit only. And even if, even if it is domestic credit, how are those banks financing themselves again? That's often by foreign money, when you look at Spain or something. So it's an absolutely valid point. Welcome. Yeah. I think it was a great, great lecture and a great discussion. Thank you for all your contributions and attendance, obviously. Before we close it, there's one um, gift for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Bayreuther Partner Cafe. <laughs> Fair trade coffee. Awesome. Fair trade coffee. Thank you very much. And chocolate. Okay. Slave-free slave chocolate, I suppose. Thank you. One last one for your goal. One last thing that next week, it's not going to be on Wednesday, but on Thursday, same time but different room, just across the hall, and age 34. Just remember, um, hope to see you again. Okay, thank you.